Okay, um, I don't have your exams graded. You can ask me why it takes me so long to grade it. No? Okay. I just heard that que I just heard that question asked. Oh, okay. So I hope to have them graded either by tomorrow or at the latest Friday. I'll send an email when you can come and get them. Uh, and if you can't come and get them, then you can email me and I'll scan it in and send it to you. Um, so I hope to get that done today. Secondly, final is next Wednesday, um, week from today and here. Both the finals are on Wednesday 8th and then one for my two sections. I have sent in the class lists to the career services and hopefully they will send me back who has all of the uh, cover letters, um, the, the LinkedIn and the resume is done. And then I will, if I'm missing anything, I'll let you know. We really just have to, we have like until next week to get to that. So I'm not quite sure. I don't have access to that. So they're just going to forward it to me. If something's missing, like I said, then we'll figure it out. Um, so I'm waiting. Yeah. When are they planning on sending back that information? Whenever they send it back to me. Oh, okay. I didn't give them a deadline. Because that's not my role. I can't just call people up and say, hey, get me this by noon tomorrow. Now, they can do that to me, but I can't do that to them. I don't have that kind of power. So whenever they come, whenever it comes back, I'll look through it and I'll say, these things are missing. And if you've already got them approved, then just tell me and I'll, I'll go back. And we'll get it squared away. It's just going to... It's just my first step is to get that back. Who knows? It might be in my email email right now but I it is okay how would they see what I don't know people that are declared chemistry majors are not showing up in the chemistry professional development canvas course so that's a problem so I we'll work it out Okay, so where are we at for our last day? Here's where we're at. Okay, let, well, on the, at the end here of class on Monday, we talked about what's called the clays and condensation. And the problem is that when you say clays and condensation, a condensation reaction should lose water and this doesn't. But we're going to actually have a number of condensation reactions where water is not a product. So what did we do? We reacted basically two moles of ester with a combination of alcohol and hydroxide and that combination always produces an alkoxide. That alkoxide is then going to deprotonate the hydrogen on the alpha carbon, which is the one next to the carbonyl. And for one of these molecules then, we're going to make an anion and the other molecule will remain intact or unenolized. The enolate then will come in and attack the carbonyl and we will end up forming that carbon-carbon bond with then the O- and the remainder of the molecule attached. So the top part of this molecule this is my new bond. The top part came from the enolate. The bottom part came from the attack on the ester carbonyl. So what happens next? This pair of electrons tries to move here, and that kicks off the OR group. 
so that the molecule that I make, and I'm going to kind of write this from carbon one here, plus you, then I'm going to write this back across. And I'll put the number in. So this is carbon one, two, and then this is three and four from carbon one, two, three, and four, carbon one, carbon two, carbon three, and carbon two. So I make this beta keto ester is that molecule. <coughs> and that is the Claisen product. So Claisen is nothing more than an aldol reaction with an ester, except we form a keto, we form a ketone instead of the OH. So our next couple of steps are: what can I do with this ester, this beta keto ester? Um, and what I can do with it is, the first thing I'm going to do is hydrolyze the ester, and the second thing I'm going to do is what's called decarboxylation. And as I think I said on fr or on Monday, people who write tests are fascinated with decarboxylation <coughs> reactions. They like to put one, two, three of them on any kind of standardized exam that they write. So am I, you know, letting the cat out of the bag if there might be one? or two or three of these on the final, no, I will bet there's probably one because that's what they like. So we need to talk about how to get to that point and then what characteristics will give you decarboxylation. So. I'm going to take that molecule. Okay, so I've got an R O C double bond O the C H. There's my ketone. And what I'm now going to do is I'm going to treat this with acid and water. So I'm going to do hydrolysis. I'm going to do hydrolysis on the ester because it's a carbon. It's a carboxylic acid derivative. So it's going to then form the beta. Now, I, now it's, a, it's a beta keto carboxylic acid. Now, I'm, in order to show what's going to happen next, what, what is going to happen next is this. This part of the molecule is going to be lost as carbon dioxide. But how does that happen? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the carboxylic acid and I'm going to twist it so that it looks like this. So that the C the OH comes up here, the double bond goes there, my CH2 with my R group goes there, my carbonyl goes there, and then there's a CH2 R group. So I'm going to put that there in a six-membered ring, and I'm going to erase this hydrogen, and I'm going to put the hydrogen up here so that you can form that conformation with an intramolecular hydrogen bond. And once this molecule is able to form that six-membered ring, and the critical part of this is that there must be a beta carbonyl group. Right now it's a ketone. Next it's going to be a carboxylic acid. There has to be a beta ketone for this mechanism to occur. So I put this into the transition state and I do, or into this conformation. I'm going to move this pair of electrons down to form the CO double bond. I'm going to break the CC bond 
and move a pair of electrons there to form a carbon-carbon double bond. And then I'm going to take the carbonyl and I'm going to formally bond the OH. So my arrows are going to go in that direction. That's going to leave me, and I'm going to write the molecule in exactly the same conformation that it was in. I'm going to have a C double bond O with the other double bond O. I know it's not linear, but that's okay. Then your double bond so that the molecule looks like that. So I've just, I've basically formed CO2. So that's, so this is the decarboxylation. CO2. Now, what is this molecule on the right? What is this? That is an enol. And so, and I mean, it's getting tedious at this point, but that's an enol. Are enols stable? No. What happens to them? They're tetomerized, in this case, to the ketone. So this will then undergo this movement of electrons so that the final product I will make will have an R group, a CH2, the, key, the ketone, and then CH2, the R group. So my final product is going to be a ketone. And how does this process occur? This process occurs with heat. So one of the things that's usually followed in Claisen is you make, you basically hydrolyze the ester to a carboxylic acid. Because that carboxylic acid has a beta keto group, or a beta carbonyl group, it can then be heated to decarboxylate. And so if you're doing, if you're doing the reaction initially, which is, it says to just add, add alcohol and base, you're probably going to form the beta keto compound. But if there's subsequent steps of H plus H2O followed by heat, you're going to do a decarboxylation. And you might say, well, do you have any practice problems? Plenty. They're all in Monday's folder. So there's the first seven questions um, on part one review that was mine. Those are the ones that last semester when everybody was using that to study for part one, they were like, I don't know how to do the first seven questions. That's because we're doing them now. When I have extra time, I would just hand those out and you guys would work on them in the last day of class. That's not happening. So um, there's those seven questions along with the ACS study guide questions that I put that I put in the folder as well. As well as top hat. So so this is the decarboxylation step. And we're going to have decarboxylation steps in other places as well. So that's Claisen followed by hydrolysis and decarboxylation. <coughs> now, if you want to do, if you want to make changes to this, which you can, we can do a reaction on a diester. So here's a diester. If you go back and look at your notes from Monday, we did an intramolecular aldol condensation reaction. So here's an intramolecular clason that's not called a clason because it ha it'll have a new name. So if I treat this, and it's got to be symmetrical, the symmetrical ester with, again, a combination of alcohol and hydroxide. I'm going to make my alkoxide, and my alkoxide is then going to react or deprotonate one of the beta hydrogens. It doesn't matter, or sorry, one of the alpha hydrogens. 
doesn't matter which one because this is a symmetrical molecule. So my RO minus is going to come over and deprotonate so that I'm going to end up with that enolate. Now that enolate then can react with the carbonyl on the opposite side of the molecule. So this is going to be intramolecular. So the C- is going to come over here and add to that carbonyl. So the question is then, I'm going to make a ring. How big of a ring? I've got one, two, three, four, five carbons. So I'm going to make a five-membered ring. And maybe I want to number this carbon 2, carbon 3, carbon 4, and carbon 5. So this is 2, 3, 4, 5, and then carbonyl is 6. So I'm going to make a five membered ring. What's attached to carbon 2, Josh? No, 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 your question. I was going to ask if, if there was a double bond in between 3 and 4, would that still be able to make a ring? Yes, it would. Um, no, it wouldn't, it wouldn't deprotonate it. That, then the double bond would go between 3 and 4. But we normally, uh, I'll show you where the double bonds come into play in a couple minutes. So if I label it like that, then what's carbon six? Carbon six is a carbonyl. There is an ester. Sorry. Sorry, it is not an ester. It is got an O minus and an RO attached to it. So that's what carbon six has. Carbon two has the ester attached to it. So what happens next? Same thing that normally happens in a in a clays and condensation. This pair of electrons comes down, RO minus gets kicked off. So what I just made was I just made a five-membered ring with a C double bond O R and then the ketone next to it. So hold on. almost forgot. Showing you where you could go wrong in writing the structure. So now this is a beta keto ester. If I then hydrolyze this one, I'm going to change the, bless you, the ester into a carboxylic acid. Plus you. So now we've got our beta keto carboxylic acid. And because there is a beta carbonyl group here, when I heat this, I'm going to lose that as CO2. And so what I will end up doing is losing CO2 and then forming just the ketone. So I just make cyclopentanone is the final product. Right, so we would say he So this is an intramolecular clasin. This is not called a clasin condensation. When it's an intramolecular clasin to form a ring, this is what's called a Dieckmann condensation. So the first part of this reaction to form the this product is a Dieckmann condensation instead of a Claisen. So, I don't know why, apparently Dieckmann decided to do this, and then they said, oh, well, we're forming rings, 
So that's important. So we'll give you the react. We'll name the reaction after you, Josh. In terms of the ACS, some, sometimes people ask us on previous exams, please use this process for X Y Z product. Do they also ask straight use this? Um, they will give you the reagents. Uh, if this was going to be the final product, the reagents would look like this. It would be number one, alcohol and hydroxide, number two, H plus H2O, and step three. So they would give you the three steps and ask you what the final product is. Uh, when I go through the exam, if there's any reagents that they use all, that we didn't, then I'll either throw that question out or I'll give you the reagents that we use that were equivalent. Okay. In the past, what I've done is I've just photocopied the exam and, and then, I've then I've just written those reagents over the top. You're going to get a legitimate copy of the exam and so there may be a sheet that goes with it that explains the, you know, another reagent. For problem disk, use this reagent. Wait, is the ACS It depends on what I want to do. Do you have any advice? <laughs> <laughs> so, well, let's go through this and then I'll then we can talk quickly about about that. So that's so that's deep. Deekman is just to form a ring from an intramolecular. Claisen is one we use two esters. And if I take a step back here, right, because this is the end of the semester, not yet the end of the semester, that's next week, but at this point, do we have any kind of perspective on all the stuff that we have learned, will learn by next week, should have learned? And the whole idea here about learning these reactions is because most people that are organic chemists are making things. They're doing synthesis. And so putting these reactions together lets us make natural products, lets us make pharmaceuticals. And so if you look at this reaction, and this is an old school reaction, this is probably like a 50s or 60s reaction. But why is it important? Why does Diekman get his own name associated with it? It's because I made a ring. And I made a ketone ring. Right? I made a cyclohexane or a cyclopentyl ring. So cyclopentanone, cyclohexanone. If I wanted to, warning, review, if I wanted to put an oxygen here and make a cyclic ester, which is called a lactone, I could use the Bayer-Villiger reaction. Why is that important? Because lactones are the framework for making a bunch of natural products. So if you take this Diekmann condensation, decarbo deep carboxylate it, and then use a Bayer-Villiger, you have a lactone molecule that you can use to make a number of, um, a number of natural products. If I, if I just said make a cyclo, make a cyclohexane molecule, that's going to be pretty rough. But this allows us to actually make that, and now I can do other things with it. So don't lose that perspective. There is a reason why you're learning these reactions. Now you may say, yeah, but I'm not going to synthesize anything in biochemistry, plants. People, systems, make things. How do they make things? Organic chemistry on really complicated molecules. Welcome to biochemistry. Which, if you take biochemistry, you can just tell Scotty, Chai, whoever you have, that biochemistry is organic chemistry on really complicated molecules. And they will probably agree. So that's... That's why we're learning these reactions, and that's important of Diekmann. Great. So, so 
So here is an ester that I can actually use to do another um, to do another series of reactions that in this case will let me make any kind of car any kind of basically long chained carboxylic acid that I would like to make. Okay. And how am I going to do that? Well, now I'm going to put one CH2 in between my two esters. And I'm going to react that then with my alkoxide so that I'm going to make that enolate. And that enolate is going to be easy to make because that alpha carbon's got two carbonyls on either side. That's going to make the hydrogen more acidic. So I make this enolate. Then I can react this enolate with an alkyl halide and it would be best if that R group was a primary. So that I'm just going to do an SN2 reaction. So I take this at, and so that's going to kick off the, the um, halide. So that now what I'm going to do is now I'm going to alkylate that central CH2 or now CH. So I'm going to alkylate that carbon. This is fine, but this is a series of ester reactions. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to treat it with H plus H2O, and then I'm going to heat it. So my H plus H2O is going to do what to the esters? They're going to hydrolyze to carboxylic acids. So after my hydrolysis reaction, I'm going to form that. Now, you can do de decarboxylation if you have a carboxylic acid, and beta to that carboxylic acid has to be a carbonyl. We've been doing this with ketone. It can also be with carboxylic acid. So I could make that six-member transition state, or not transition state, it's really... confirmation. So I can put a beta dicarboxylic acid into that six-membered ring structure and so I can decarboxylate it. I can have this pair of electrons come down here, that pair of electrons move there, that pair of electrons move up to the OH, and then I will end up losing CO2 and now forming that carboxylic acid. So decarboxylation occurs with the carboxylic acid with a beta carbonyl group. Carbonyl group could be a ketone or it could be a carboxylic acid. So looking at this molecule then as my product, this whole synthesis here allows me to make a carboxylic acid with any R group I want as long as it's primary. So I could prepare a uh, four-membered acid, a five-membered acid, a six-membered acid. So it lets me make those carboxylic acids. And again, that's a fairly straightforward reaction. Now this is what's called the malonic, malonic acid synthesis, or sorry, malonic ester synthesis. And you would think you were making the malonic ester, you were synthesizing it, but instead you're starting with malonic esters and you're synthesizing basically carboxylic acids out of those. So the malonic ester in this reaction 
corresponds to the beginning molecule. Right. And malonic is the common name for the three carbon dicarboxylic acid. We didn't go into common names, but basically, if you have a diacid, the simplest one is a two carbon acid, which is called oxalic acid. If that sounds familiar, that's what we use to clean out the glassware and remove the brown cam or brown MnO4 MnO2 that we used in lab, or that we got as a product from Camino 4, is oxalic acid. If it's a three carbon acid, it's malonic. And there's actually, let's see, uh, it goes, oh my, such green apple pie. So it goes oxalic, malonic, succinic, Remember, and bromo succinamide, that's five. Then glyteric, adipic, which is six. And then I think it's pimelic is the next one. But I don't know. This has been around as long as I, when I took organic chemistry. That's the, that's the whatever it's called, mnemonic that you use to memorize the names of dicarboxylic acids, which is such an important topic that I did talk about it when we talked about naming acids. But I'm sure it's in your book. Um, so that's where malonic comes from. So again, I want to make this kind of acid. What kind of R group do I have? Well, let's go back. I can make it all in this one step. Am I giving up some CO2? Yes, but I can make that molecule. So that's the malonic ester synthesis. And it can be used to make all sorts of, it's used to make all sorts of carboxylic acids. Okay. Next. Uh, warning review. A review is coming. Okay, here is an alpha, beta, unsaturated ketone. Here's the review question. The review question is, here are my two choices of reagents to add to this alpha beta unsaturated ketone. One will attack the carbonyl, one will attack the beta carbon. Which is which? So, so the organolithium is being a hard, harder reagent or more um, reactive reagent is going to go after the carbonyl. The, green, the uh, cuprate is going to go after the beta carbon. So we have to remember that. But the, my question now is going to be, let me use that molecule as a reactant. Only now, my question would be, What's an enolate going to do? So what if I make an enolate? And I can make the enolate of probably an ester. I can make it of a ketone or aldehyde. 
where's the enol ache going to add? That's a rhetorical question, unless you read ahead. Because what's going to happen is this C minus is going to attack the beta carbon. This pair of electrons will move over here. That pair of electrons will move up there. So this was what we called before conjugate addition. And that's what this enolate will do. So writing then the product of this reaction going to end up then adding the enolate to the beta carbon. And so I'm going to end up with the molecule like this. So basically I'm going to take that molecule and I'm going to add an acid to it. I'm going to rewrite this so it's all in a line. So I'm going to take the CH3, the C double bond O, the CH with the R down here, the CH with the other R down here, and then the CH double bond to the C. Now if I make this an H, if I protonate that, what is that? An enol. Are enol stable? No, what do they do? They tautomerize back to a ketone in this case. So the final product of this reaction is going to be this. So that I did conjugate addition of the enolate to an alpha beta unsaturated ketone. And if I want it, well, what is this? This is an alpha beta gamma delta. So this is a delta keto ketone in this case. Where did this original alpha beta unsaturated ketone come from? It could have been the product of an aldol condensation. Or it could or it could have been I put a bromine on it to do alpha bromine brom to make the alpha bromo ketone, right? The lacrimators that and then I could just do like a terpetoxide and do an E2 to form the alpha beta unsaturated. So this, I mean, this is nothing more than a twist, except I just need to know that it's conjugate addition. This is what's called Michael addition. So again, if it's getting tedious and it seems like I'm doing the same thing over and over again, I am, right? Because we make the enolate. Now we know that enolates will add to the beta carbon versus the carbonyl. If this was just an aldol condensation, it would attack the carbonyl. So that's Michael addition. And the last reaction of the year or ever, depends. We save the best one for last. No. There are, there are no, that is not that Michael. I think it's, forget, I forget exactly what his first name was, but. Okay, let's start with the ring. And let's react that ring with our RO minus. And let's ask ourselves the question, I now have an unsymmetrical, a unsymmetrical ketone, so which of these two hydrogens will 
the RO minus removed preferentially? And I will tell you the answer. The answer is this one. Why? Because the other resonance structure of that enolate is going to look like this with the double bond. So the other struct the other resonance of the enolate is going to have a carbon-carbon double bond. What's the more stable carbon-carbon double bond? The one that's most substituted. Right. So that hydrogen is going to be removed. And I'm using an alkoxide that can get to either hydrogen equally well. All right, so now I just made an enolate. Great. Now what are we going to react it with? We could react it with lots of things. Like we could react it with bromine from last time. We could react it with another um, ketone or aldehyde. We could react it with an ester. We could alkylate it. But let's react this with an alpha beta unsaturated ketone. And very specifically, let's react it with this alpha beta unsaturated ketone. This being an enolate is going to add to the beta carbon. So this pair of electrons is going to move here, that's going to move there, that's going to move there. So the product that I'm going to make, and I'm going to want a 1, 2, a 3, and a 4 here. I'm going to form the bond to carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, carbon 4. So carbon 3 has got the double bond on it. And this is 1, 2, 3, So when we do conjugate addition, we just end up adding that group to carbon, to the beta carbon. And so that's what I've done here. All right, great. Now let's do more base. So if I add more base to this, I'm going to wind, I'm going to try and wind this molecule up. So there's carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, and now carbon 4 as the enolate. So I'm going to react and I'm going to react the alkoxide and it's going to react with carbon 4. So now what is that enolate going to do? Well, I've written it in this structure so that it's going to come in and attack that carbon. And so what am I going to make there? First of all, I'm going to make a fused ring. Again, carbon one, carbon two, carbon three, and carbon. And then with the H plus, I'm going to make a beta hydroxy ketone. And then what's going to happen to that beta hydroxy ketone? It's probably going to lose water. form that fused ring system. <coughs> so this is called
Robinson annulation. And so this is actually the most complicated of the condensation reactions. But let's just give it a moment of perspective or reflection, right? We're not afraid to use that word here. I've had like three personal visits from students trying to make up their mind about coming to John Carroll and parents. I don't know if I've done a good job of selling or not. But. So that fused ring system is the beginning of making more fused rings which leads us to making biological molecules called steroids, right? If we start fusing these ring systems together, we make steroids. What are steroids? <laughs> there you go, steroids. Not, and vi vitamin D, it, those kinds of vitamins are also have the fused ring systems. So if you think about, well, how am I going to make those? Robinson annulation is a beautiful way to make it. Of course, then you have to say, well, where did this cyclohexane or cyclohexanone come from? Dequin. Only use a dequin with one extra carbon in there, so instead of making a five-membered ring, I now make a six-membered ring. So uh, sadly, these always come in the last day of class, but or close to the last day of class. So the idea here is that these are these are precursors that we can use to make really important biological molecules, and so the way to do that is to use all of these condensation reactions. But this is the most complicated one because if I just gave you this and you didn't know what the product was. You'd have to line the molecule just right in order to get that fused member ring, to get that fused ring. But six, remember, six member rings and five member rings are great. Four member rings, no. Seven, no. Five and six are perfect. So this then would let you make uh, vitamin A or vit different vitamins uh, and steroids. Okay, so that's condensation. Now, what, if I had time left, was I going to go over it? probably has something to do with tests and points. Because yeah. someone asked it. Um, curve. Okay. Um, I'm gonna, I will look at the final exam you know, scores, I'll add those all in. Right now, remember, I think I screwed up and left last year's, or la yeah, last year's final lines in, so I'm not gonna move those. I'm not gonna move them off. Um, but they could still move down. I will look at everything together. I kinda have a general idea on, can look at an exam and say, you know, if you've been getting an A all along, you sort of get this score on the final. Um, but everything, if there is, the curve will come at the end. The curve may already have come in terms of where those lines are now. But that's going to be a problem for me next week. So what you want to do is do the best you can. Uh, I do not usually let people's grades go in free fall meaning that if you were like in an A minus, you wouldn't end up with like a C by just by just by taking the final exam. However, that does not mean that we should not study for this. Um, it just means that I will use my best judgment, which you will have to just assume is great judgment when I look at all of this. There may be a couple questions that you can't answer on the f on the final. Um, 
then I'll actually tell you not to mess with those problems. Because the last thing I want you to do is trying to answer a problem that you can't answer. So I might say we're going to omit these two problems. Everything else I think we've learned or I think you could figure out from going back to basic principles. Okay, so that's, you've got some problems on this. Remember the chapter 24 problems, I'm going to count. Everything else is bonus if you want to do that. You have some practice problems in um, the folder. There's ACS study guides over um, behind the front desk in the two-hour reserve in the library. If you have questions, email me, come see me. Um, Friday is reading day when everybody's supposed to be reading and studying. Um, it could be considered a sleep-in day. Um, that's up to you. But um, I will be, I can guarantee you I will be around like after, well, after three. And I'll also be around around lunchtime. But they're trying. If you think you're getting slammed with stuff, I'm getting slammed with meetings left and right. And they're aggravating me. But that's my problem. So I will be around. Um, and then, of course, his lab. So. Um, I will be around at least in the afternoons on the weekend, so if you want to shoot me an email, come see me. Otherwise, I will be in next week on Monday and Tuesday. I think outside the lab final on Tuesday, I'm, I'm around. So you can check my schedule and make an appointment or just check my schedule and see if it's not blocked off. But if you have anything, email me. Like I said, come see me. Otherwise, my, my suggestions work backwards. I will email you when the exams are done so that you can come and get them, or if you can't come and get them, I'll scan them and send them to you.